Hello, Fast Fam. Thanks for tuning in. I'm Craig Lieberman, and I've been tinkering on cars since 1980. I've owned more than 40 cars in my life. Some were heroes, some were zeros. But never in my wildest dreams would I ever guess that three of my cars would go on to star in a motion picture franchise. My Supra, my GTR, and my Maxima all had starring roles in Universal's Fast and Furious movies. Over the next three years, I'd served Universal as a technical advisor. I helped choose the cars, procure the parts, oversee their builds, and support both production and post-production. I have some cool stories to tell about what it was like to build these cars and to work with the cast. I was there, on set, in the production meetings, working on cars, hanging with the actors, and consulting on post-production. So follow along as I tell the stories. Let's jump in. In this episode, we're looking at Brian's Mitsubishi Evo from Too Fast, Too Furious. Like the other cars in the franchise, the internet is filled with inaccurate information, so it's time to look at some hard facts. First off, this car almost didn't happen at all. In early discussions about what cars we would use for Brian in this movie, Universal had actually looked at several cars, including the Dodge Neon SRT4, the Skyline GTR, and the Mitsubishi Evo. But there was very little chance we could even get an Evo since the Evo had not been yet released in the United States. And although the Neon SRT4 had also not been released, Universal was working to get pre-production models of that car. That meant that quite possibly an SRT4 would have been one of Brian's main cars, and the other would probably end up being an Evo only if we could get one. As you probably know from an earlier video, I fought against using SRT4s, and we ended up replacing it with my GTR. Now all we needed was an Evo. If we could not get an Evo, there was still a small chance that the SRT4 could have been used. As I mentioned before, the SRT4 simply doesn't have the panache of a GTR or an Evo, especially since the car hadn't even been released yet, so no one knew anything about it. I also suggested other cars like the Acura NSX, and we even went so far as to buy some NSXs. It was a confusing time, we weren't sure what cars were going to end up in what roles. Fortunately, Mitsubishi came to our rescue. They had four Evo 7s that were ready to be shipped to a European rally team. Mitsubishi diverted these cars and instead sent them to us for this movie. There's still a lot of confusion about this car as I've read so many articles online proclaiming that this car was an Evo 8. Just as a reminder, the Evo 7s were released in 2001 and the Evo 8s were released in 2003. This movie was being filmed in 2002 before the Evo 8s were even being built. So, to be perfectly clear, all four of our Evos were, in fact, Evo 7s. Like most tuner cars in the early movies, stock wasn't good enough. We wanted to stylize these cars, but finding parts for the Evo 7s would be a challenge since the Evo 7s were never to be released in the USA. To get aftermarket parts, we leaned on Mitsubishi's partners like Rally Art and ARC to get what we needed. All we did was damned body kits, added an ARC GT2 style rear wing, Custom Genera TYC taillights, Motegi FF5 wheels, and Toyo 235 4018 tires. Interior styling was also simple. The car had factory Recaro seats, but we added an Apex tack, boost gauge, temp gauge, and volt gauge, and a Sparco shift knob. That was pretty much the it for the interior. The cars were converted to rear wheel drive to make them easier to slide around. In our production notes, these cars were numbered 42, 43, 44, and 45. That number is significant for how we manage the cars on set. So let's go through it. Car number 42 was the Hero 1 car. This car was the only car to get some engine dress-up parts, including a green painted cam cover, AEEM adjustable cam gears, a Gretti catch can, some green vacuum hoses, and a few other bits. This car also got an HKS clutch since the OE clutch was roasted during some practice driving sessions with the actors. An aftermarket intercooler was installed as was some neon lighting. Car number 43 was the Hero 2 car. This car was used to crash through the gate. which is, This was the only other Evo to get neon lights. This car is still in the USA and is owned by a guy in Pennsylvania. Car number 44 was stunt number 1. Since we needed a little extra power with this car, we fitted it with a Rally Art ECU. This helped this car make 330 horsepower as dynoed. This car also got an upgraded clutch. This car was later sold to a buyer in Norway, and in 2019, it was sold again to a collector in France. I saw the car in 2019. The car is in amazing shape. Even the paint is pristine. Car number 45 was assigned to first unit, and this car had the flamethrower exhaust system and a fuel cell in the trunk. This car is unaccounted for, and we believe Mitsubishi crushed the car after production, so that car probably no longer exists. 
Construction of these cars took place at Eddie Paul's warehouse in Southern California. This is the same place we built the cars for the first movie. In this warehouse, the cars were painted and the gauges were mounted, after which the cars were shipped to Miami for the finishing work. The finishing work included adding the wheels and the graphics. Initially, they chose to replicate the graphics I had on my GTR before Universal rented it. Later on, they added more graphics, which were basically images of the car inserted into a rounded box. It didn't look bad in my opinion. In fact, I thought it looked better than the other cars. I'll always show it on screen. None of these cars received any nitrous oxide parts, not even nitrous bottles. So these cars did not have any kind of nitrous system. One modification that all the Evos did receive has created confusion amongst movie fans for years, and that's the taillights. It's actually a pretty interesting story. During the making of this movie, many companies wanted to showcase their products through product placement on the cars. It's a common practice in Hollywood. One of these companies was a company called Genera TYC. They are a company that makes OEM lighting and wanted to get in on the tuner aftermarket. To do so, they wanted to get their tear lights on our Evos, but they only made parts for the Lancer, not the Evo. We decided to do some body work to the Evos to make these tail lights fit. This required custom fabrication to accomplish. After some cutting, grinding, reshaping, and some body filler, we got them to work. Since we only had four actual Evos, we had to come up with a solution to build a MICRIG car. We didn't have an extra Evo to spare, so we didn't want to cut one up to turn it into a MICRIG car. Mitsubishi also donated four Lancers. One was made to look like Brian's Evos. The rest were painted different colors to be used in the warehouse scramble scene. There were a couple of key action scenes with the Evo. One was the freeway chase. This was done using at least two Evos plus the MICRIG Lancer, which had been made to look like an Evo. If you remember the sequence, you remember Paul spinning the car and driving in reverse at 80 miles an hour. Spoiler alert, an Evo will not do 80 miles an hour in reverse. Gear ratios can be calculated using a bit of algebra, and if you take a look at the gear ratio in an Evo, it works out to a 3.416. When you do the math, the top speed in reverse of an Evo 7 works out to be 35.56 miles per hour. So how do we do it? To make the car look faster, we used the MICRIG Lancer mounted backwards. By using close-ups, you never see that Brian isn't driving a full car. Instead, he's sitting in a MICRIG car. With clever editing, you can't tell the difference between him sitting in a MICRIG car and him sitting in an actual car. The other big stunt sequence was crashing through the gate at the boatyard. This was done with the Hero 2 car. The car sustained real damage, of course, but thankfully we had backup cars. Yet another sequence dubbed the Barrel Race showcased the Evo in a race setting. Of course, such a race is a bit contrived, it doesn't really happen in real life, but we finally get to hear what the Evo sounds like at full throttle, except the engine sounds were not from an Evo. As was done for the first movie, sounds for the Evo were heavily edited in post-production. For this car, we used a Honda S2000 and other engine sounds, including a WRX. The final sequence using the Evo was the warehouse scramble scene. Brian and Roman make their escape, and the movie wraps up with no explanation as to what happened to the Evos as far as the story is concerned. And so the Evo faded away like so many cars in the later movies of the franchise. Transient, here for a moment and then gone. Still, it had its moment in the spotlight and it shined. It has become a fan favorite that has occurred for nearly 20 years. Thanks for watching, everybody. Tune in next time for some more behind the scenes stories.